the I God series is based on a phrase found in Exodus chapter 3. Well, we'll go ahead and put the title slide up. We'll go ahead and talk about go look at that real quick. Today we're going to look at I God am all knowing. Okay? So Lexi's running PowerPoint. Last week I kept calling Ivy Hannah for some reason, but but anyway, uh, you think I know my own child's name, but uh, anyway, so Lexi's running PowerPoint. Lexi, go on to Exodus chapter 3. We'll get back to that here in a second. But, uh, Exodus chapter 3, this is uh, God and Moses. We've talked about Moses a little bit. I'm not going to go all, all through it again today, but in the middle of uh, Moses' uh, first Exodus from uh, Egypt, He's out in the desert and he encounters this burning bush. And God said to Moses, uh, I am who I am. In verse 14, he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And so Moses had asked God you know, who, what his name was. And this is where God said, Tell them I am sent you. And, and so with this phrase, I am who I am, you find a lot of theology. And last week we talked about God's omnipresent with a message called, I, God, am all present. Or excuse me, the first week. And then last week we talked about God's omnipotence. We saw a message where, I, where God says, I, God, am all powerful. And today we're going to be looking at God's omniscience. Where God says, I, God, am all knowing. I, God, am all knowing. So omni uh, is the Latin word that means all. And then sense or science, I guess, is where we get the word science, is a Latin word that means knowledge. And so we have all knowledge. And so, you know, it means God knows everything there is to know. You know, I know some people like that, don't you? Uh, but, but God knows everything there is to know. Just think about that. You know, God, God, there, God never makes a new discovery. All that is or ever will be or ever was, God knows. And and, you know, so God's knowledge is complete. And so you know what that means? That means God is never surprised. You know, it, not one time has anybody ever sat down to write their blog, you know, and they write their blog out, and, and, and uh, God up in heaven says, What? I didn't know that. You know, that, that don't happen with God. God, God knows. And, you know, there's, there's no mathematical equation that's too difficult for God. Now think about that. There is no jeopardy question that God does not know the answer to, right? He, he knows them all, and and so, and, and another thing is when you think about God being uh, omniscient, is that you know there, God's never uncertain. Y'all y'all ever uncertain? You know, uh -huh. it, it, you know, you think you know something, but you're not sure, and so so you kind of waver. You know, is this the right thing to do or not, or or is this truth or not? You know. We're wishy-washy like that a lot. God's not like that. God is never uncertain at all. And so, He's never surprised. He's never uncertain. God always knows exactly the right path. He knows the best path. And He knows whether we should go this way or that way. God knows. We don't always know, but God knows, doesn't He? And so, that is the omniscience of God. That I, God, am all-knowing. So, there's basically... Two different ways, just give you a kind of a, a, a little bit of insight. There's two different ways that theologians have tried to resolve this concept of the omniscience of God, of God knowing everything. And one of the ways that they describe it is they, they uh, call it foreknowledge. And foreknowledge, if you've heard of foreknowledge, it basically just means that God knows what's going to happen before it ever happens. That's God's foreknowledge. And of course He does, doesn't He? Uh, he knows what's going to happen. That, you know, before it ever takes place. And so he knows the future. Um, and so, not only that, but there's another way that uh, some theologians try to figure this out. And they, they use a word called predestination. Okay? And so, the, these theologians say, well, it's not just that God knows what's going to happen. The way he knows what's going to happen is because God causes everything that happens to happen. And so they use this term, and it's, it's called predestination, and we're predestined, and, and they say, you know, they're, you know I, I guess we don't really have a choice in the matter, that, that God's got everything worked out. And so, but you know what, the way I see Scripture <coughs> is that uh, the truth is that neither one of these views are sufficient by themselves. Uh, you know, it's both and, uh, you know, it's both of them in a sense, because uh, when we look, God is not someone we can fully comprehend. We've talked about that a little bit. God exists above the past, 
present, and future. Uh, he's not uh, uh, bound by time and space like we are. <laughs> And, but, and so he, he's, he is something we're going to talk about. He's transcendent. He's above all that. But at the same time, <clears throat> he's completely involved in everyday operations, in the little minutia of our life. He's interested in that. The Bible talks about, we've looked in Matthew chapter 6, he even knows the very numbers of the hairs on our head. Easier for some than others, I know. But, you know, but he knows where we live, and he allows us all the free will to make our own decisions. And so somehow in God's sovereignty, sitting above and creating and moving, and, and he's, he's controlling everything, and He knows what's going to happen, but yet at the same time, He allows us responsibility to make the choices we make. That's what's so amazing to me, is that you know, we're responsible, and, and, and it's a mystery. And Romans 8 says He's working all these things out together for good to those who are His. And so that's what's great about it. We can trust Him because we talked about He's, he's all-powerful, right? And so we know He has the power to do it and He's got the knowledge. And, and, so he's, and so, you know, so God is transcendent. That's another theological term we're not going to really delve into by itself. But that means that He transcends time and space. He's far and beyond anything that we can comprehend. But at the same time, He's imminent. And that means He's right here involved in the day-to-day. -day. And, you know, God's impossible for us to comprehend this side of heaven. I mean, we just can't do it. And um, But you know what? We can gain a better understanding of who He is. And He wants us to know Him. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this, this series. You know, and a lot of people say, well, hey, if I can't really understand God, and if I can't comprehend Him, is it really worth it for us to try to understand who He is? Well, sure it's worth it. You know, think about this, though. If, if, if I can fully comprehend God... You know, I don't know about you, but, but I want a God who's beyond belief. Don't you? I want a God who, who I can't understand because I'll just tell you, I'm not that smart. And so, I mean, I want a God who's bigger than me. You know, I want to know that I got a God that's indescribable, uncontainable, powerful, untamable, awestruck, amazing God. That's the kind of God I want, aren't you? And, and that's the kind of God we've got. That's who He is. And even though He's incomprehensible, there are things that He wants us to understand about Him. And He's given us understanding. And that's why He's given us His Word. That's why Jesus came. That's why He lived and He died. So that He could reveal Himself to us. So that we can understand who He is. And who we are in light of who He is. And how much we need Him. And so all these things come into play. The omnipresence of God, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, all these fancy words, you know, God is everywhere all the time. He's, he's all-powerful and He's all-knowing. And we see these in Psalm 139. We've already looked at Psalm 139 once. And uh, we looked at it when we were talking about the omnipresence of God. But now I want to look at it in light of the um, uh it's one of my own omniscience of God. The all-knowing part of God. And all these characteristics are so intertwined. Sometimes it does get confusing. I can't remember which one I'm on. But anyway, so y'all pray for me. All right? But let's read this together. Let's read these first six verses. Uh, it's a psalm of David. And he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, Lord, uh, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot attain it. I cannot understand it. Now notice that last, last sentence especially. I love how David puts this. He says, you know, your knowledge, you, you're, you're, so, you're too great for me to even understand it. He marvels at the mystery of God. And so in this passage, we see all these things. The transcendence of God. We see the eminence because he says he's undescribable, but yet he's with him. He, he knows everything about you. So he knows even before words on my tongue. And so we see all these characteristics in here. We see the... The transcendence, we see the eminence, we see the omnipresence, we see the, uh, the, uh, the power of God, the omnipotence, and, and we see the omniscience. He, and I tried to highlight, you may not be able to see it on here, but the, all those things where he says he knows. God knows, doesn't he? He knows everything. But he still loves us. 
You know, we've talked about that. But, you know, and so when we think about that, here's the thing, you know, God is hard to understand, but, but the more you understand about God, the more life's going to make sense to you. Because trying to live life and without an understanding of who God is and what He's trying to do here, uh, we just mess things up. And I don't know about you, but I've made a lot of stupid decisions in my life. You know, my judgment's been messed up, and because of that, I've brought on a lot of needless suffering in my own life. Anybody got a testimony? Amen. Say amen. amen. We sung, amen. say amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And, you know, we can identify that. You know, it would be nice sometimes, wouldn't it, to, to just um, know the answers of things before we do them, you know, to know what would happen. If we could just know that, if we know the consequences before we make our stupid decisions, a lot of times that would probably keep us from doing them, wouldn't it? You know, God knows. He already knows what the consequences will be. And so that's why it's wise for us to listen to Him and follow Him. God's got all the answers. And because God's all-knowing, because God's all-knowing, I can trust God with my life. Okay? Because God's omniscient, I can trust God with all areas of my life. And that's what we need to do. Because you know what happens a lot of times? This is what happens with us sometimes. is We want to give God a portion of our life. You know, we look at it like a pie. And we say, okay, God, I want you to be a part of this life. This is my family life right here. So, God, I want you to be all up in my family. And I want you to, I want you to just, just cover my family. And, and, and you know, and, and my relationship with my mom and dad or whatever. And, you know, my golf game, God. I want you all up in my golf game because i got to have your power, you know, or whatever. Whatever it is. But then we, you know, our work life or, or maybe we got something going on on the side that we, we don't want God to be a part of that, right? That's not the way it works. You know, when God comes in your life, he, He's not a slice of pie. He's the filling. You know, you put the filling in there, it, it, he covers, it covers everything. You know, it don't matter where you slice it. That's where you want God in your life. It's, it, it's part of all, of all of your life. And, and God's all-knowing, and so we got to trust Him with all areas of our life, okay? And so if we're going to do that, here's what, here's what I want to say this morning. I can trust God. Three different ways we can trust God with our life. Three different areas. The first one, go ahead, Lexi. I can trust God with my future. I can trust God with my future. Let's think about the future for a minute, because and it's kind of fun, isn't it? I mean, I, I thought about, you know, uh, uh, just kind of remembering what I used to think about what life would be like in 2015 when I was 15, you know? I mean, uh, you know, I still haven't won the MVP of the NFL yet, but, you know, uh, got a few years left, maybe, you know, who knows? But anyway, but, you know, we try to think about you know, the future. Who, who's gonna, who are we going to be hanging around a year from now? Let's think about What about a year from now? What, what's life going to be like a year from now? Anybody know? I mean, we don't really know, do we? We, we like to think about it. A year from now, yeah, we'll probably be in our new building, won't we? Hopefully. A lot quicker than that. But hopefully it'll all be fixed up. It'll be nice. And, and we'll have at least twice as many on Sunday morning as we got now. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? You think about that. And, and, um, you know, we're going to be reaching people. There's going to be a lot more people saved and on their way to heaven next year that are part of the Fellowship Church. But, but where, who are you going to be hanging around a year from now? Where are you going to be? What are you going to be doing? What about five years from now? Let's think about five years. You know, some of you, maybe you're thinking about well, five years from now, I'll, I'll be, I would have graduated. You know, or maybe, maybe you, you hope to be married in five years. Maybe, you know, you're going to have a new child maybe in five years, you hope, or, or something like that. And then what about ten years? Ten years from now, what's life going to be like? You know, maybe your kids are going to be grown ten years from now, and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, you're thinking about that, or maybe twenty years from now, what's life going to be? Twenty years from now, maybe you're thinking, hey, maybe you're going to have it made, and you're going to be retired on some Caribbean island, you know, and that's where we're going to just chill, you know, chillax, you know, twenty years. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know, you know, I don't know, but but you know, somebody said I spend time thinking about my future. Because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. <laughs> Think about it. You know, life's worth planning, isn't it? You think about that. But, and, you know, a lot of us have some great plans. You know, we, I, I've known people, I'm not one of them, but I've known people that just, they got every step of their life planned. I'm more kind of a flight by night thing. You know, just grab whatever comes along my way kind of thing. Seems like. But, but, you know, a lot of people, they got everything planned out. And, you know, but what happens is we don't always, things don't work out the way we've got a plan, do they? I mean, it just, life just doesn't happen that way most of the time. But, 
But, and some of you have got some great plans. And some of you have made some decisions. Your life's really changed. And, and now you've got a bright future. And God's going to use you. And, and you've got some good things going on. But let me tell you something. Regardless how great your plan is, God's got a better plan. He's got a better plan for you. Now, you know, now it might be slightly different. It might be radically different than yours. But I can guarantee you, God's plan is better than your plan. God's plan is better than my plan. You know, so the question is not, does God have a great plan for my future? That answer is yes. God has a great plan for your future. But the, the question is this, is, is am I going to do what it takes to live by God's plan and not my plan? You see, uh, God, I can trust God in my future. The problem is we don't. You know, we want to write our own future. When in reality, we all let God write our future. Because He got a better plan than we got. And His ways are better than ours, right? And, the, and so the issue is not, are you willing to trust the all-knowing God? Or, excuse me, that is the issue. Are you willing to trust the all-knowing God? And you think about Jeremiah 29, 11. We've talked about this verse a few times. A lot of times people just grab this and bring it out of context. But I, I want to give you a little bit of context here because I think it definitely applies to us because Jeremiah was a prophet in the midst of Babylonian captivity. That means all of, all of the children of Israel, they'd be taken to Bab Babylon they had been bound, you know, there. They were living in a strange land. They have been exposed to false gods. And, and they, were, they were slaves. I mean, you know. And, and so uh, they had some prophets running around trying to give them a little bit of hope, some false hope, like some preachers we know today that would say, hey, if you, do, if you put a $20 bill in the offering plate, God will give you a $200 bill. That's a lie. You know, the truth is, Jeremiah told him the truth. He said, you know what? We're slaves in a foreign land. Life's tough right now. And it's going to be tough. But you know what he says? But God says, I know the plans I have for you. And he says, this is what the Lord declares. Plans for your welfare, not for evil, but to give you a future and a hope. And I'm here to tell you, folks, life's rough right now. And, and you know, and we don't know what all we're going to have to face. And, you know, we live in a sin... We're, we're, in essence, almost like slaves in a sin-cursed world. But we've been redeemed and we belong to Christ. And He's got plans for a future for us. And he, His plans are good. And we should trust Him. Amen. Okay? There's, gonna, there's better days a coming. Okay? And so, uh, what, now here's our decision. We can wallow in the pity of the day and live like we have no hope or we, you know, or we can live our lives rejoicing in God's promise that He's going to give us a hope and a future. Right? And so that, that's what we need to do. And so what we have the opportunity to do is to scrap our plan and go with God's plan. Alright? What we need to do is just rip up our plan and get rid of that and say, God, you know, I've been following my plan for a long time. And you know what? It's not worked out so good. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to throw my plan away and I'm going to go on your plan. All right, that's what we need to do. So are you willing to do that? <laughs> are you willing to do that? You know, are you willing to lean on the all-knowing God and say, God, I'm going with your plan. And, and if we're going to go with God's plan, then we've got to let Him lead us. Because, look, He knows the future. We don't know the future. And so that's the way it works. And so we've got to learn to trust God, okay? And so um, we all have uncertainties about the future. You know, when we think about it, and what I'm saying to you is we can lean into the all-knowing God and trust Him with your future, and whatever it is you're uncertain about, just turn that over to God. You know, just trust God with it. Give God your future. And so, and so when you can turn over, when you, when you turn over things to God, because here's the problem, you know, we, we worry about tomorrow, we worry about what's going to happen. We just need to relax in the arms of Jesus. I say that to people all the time. I'm not so good at it. But that's what we need to do, isn't it? We need to relax in the arms of Jesus. When times get tough, sometimes we just need to chill. You know, and say, okay, God, I trust you. You know, I'm scared right now, but I trust you because I know you've got a plan for me, a future, and a hope for me, and I trust you. Okay? And, and so I'm just going to relax, you know? And so everybody turn to your neighbor and say, relax. Tell them to chill. Some of y'all chilling too much now. Wake up, all right? But, uh, but you know, it, it, and the way we do that is we take one day at a time. One day at a time. Now that's how we live our future. That's how we let God take control of our future. Take one day at a time. You know, we, a lot of times we get so worried about tomorrow that we can't enjoy today. 
Just live today for Jesus. That's all he asks. Just live today. You know, just, just do the right thing today. You know, right now. And uh, trust God with your future. Rest in His arms. And so that leads us to the second uh, benefit that we have that we can get from the um, omniscience of God. Is not only can we trust God with our past, I mean, excuse me, with our future, but we can trust God, uh, trust God with our present. So I just told you the third point too, didn't I? We can trust God with our past. Of course, some of y'all are smart. Y'all don't figure that out. But anyway, but see, the reason we can trust God with our present, and if I get on the wrong tense, please forgive me, y'all, but, but is because the reason we can trust God with tomorrow, with our future, is because we can trust Him with today. And so, you know, it kind of builds on itself. You, you live life one day at a time. And think about this. Now, now follow me. It's going to get confusing, all right? Some of y'all are going to be gone. Right. But but but, but y'all see what I'm talking about. The, there's only today, really. There's no future, really, when you think about it. Think about it, okay? Just bear with me. Because there's no tomorrow, because when you get there, it'll be today. Right? And, and yesterday's gone, so tomorrow, and tomorrow's not here yet, so all you really have is today. Follow me? Some of you are saying yes, and some of you are going... But, yeah, but, but look... Live today. You know, live in the present for Jesus. You can't live tomorrow for Jesus because it's not here yet. And you can't go back and redo yesterday. All you can do is live for Jesus today. You understand? Don't worry about yesterday. It's gone. Don't worry about what you did or didn't do. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. And don't worry about tomorrow because it's not here yet. Live for Jesus today. Enjoy Him today. You know, you ever notice the same word we use for our present tense is the same word we use for our gifts? You know, birthday presents and Christmas presents and things like that. So think about today as a gift from God. A present that He gives you. And I see people all the time, and we take this too lightly, don't we? You know, when you wake up in the morning and you realize you're still living, <laughs> thank God for today. And thank God for today. He's given you another opportunity to live on this earth for His glory and accomplish the task that He created you to accomplish. And so, you know, all, all God expects you to do is trust Him today. He knows what you're going through. Uh, he knows what you're going through today. God knows all about the pressures in your life today. And He knows what you need to do today. He knows what you need to do today to accomplish His best plan for your future. And so, all you have to do is trust Him today. Day by day. Just trust Him today. And every day, God's going to reveal to you the next step. You know, it, 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 and that's the way, I think that's kind of the way God's designed it. Because He don't reveal to us everything we're going to do for the rest of our life. We don't know, you know, on Facebook people share these things that tell you how you're going to die. Y'all seen them and they put on your tombstone? I wonder how many of those come, to, come true. Is that prophecy or not? I bet it's not. But, but, you know, we don't know, do we? We don't really know, but we know what's going on today. And God wants us just to live today. Y'all ever watch the Amazing Race game show kind of thing? Y'all watch that on TV? God, <laughs> you know, I, to be honest with you, I've not watched it in a few years. But, but we we watched it a few few series. It's been on a long time, but, but I think it's still running. But but um, it, it, Amazing Race is where these these teams get together. I think it's two people usually, and and um, they they have these contests. They have legs, and they don't know where they're going. And, you know, they'll, they'll pick up these cards that tell them, uh, give them a task to do or a place to go. And they race. And, and the different legs, they don't know, you know, where they're, they don't know the future. They just know what they got to do right then. You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all have seen the show. You know what I'm talking about. They usually don't have any idea where they're going to wind up. They just get these hints at pit stops. And that directs their steps, tell them what they do and where to go next. And, you know, that's how God directs our lives, really, when you think about it. You know, we just need to obey Him today. He doesn't show us the end result of our future really here. You know, we know a little bit. And he gives us hints and glimpses and those kinds of things. But He leads us turn by turn. He gives us the step we need to take today. And then He'll show us the next step that we need to take the next day. And then the next day, He'll show you the next step. And he reveals to us what He wants us to do day by day. And so we don't have to worry about it all. We just got to worry about what we're supposed to be doing right then. And some of us, you know, we can't worry about too many things at once anyway. You know, so that's a good thing, right? And so the reason he does that is because he wants us to grow. You know, so, for some of us, if we knew what we was going to have to face deep in the future, we couldn't handle it today. And so he's trying to prepare us and mature us today 
so that we can be who He wants us to be in the future. And so all we got to do is just, just worry about that today. So uh, a lot of us get concerned because God doesn't lay it all out. You know, and what happens is we follow Jesus, and we go where God says, and then there's a roadblock, or there's a delay, or, or there's some construction, and you know, we just freak out. You know, we get upset, and, and you know, and, and a lot of times we want to blame God, don't we? We want to blame God and say, God, you led me down this path, and don't you look right here. <coughs> like God didn't know, you know? Uh, he knew, and it's there for a reason. And we just got to trust Him. Don't we? we just got to trust Him. Remember the story of the disciples? We've talked about this a couple of times. I want to bring it up again. You know, the disciples, uh, they begin to follow Jesus, and they're following day by day, just like we're talking about, and they get on, get on this ship with Jesus. They're going across the Sea of Galilee to the other side in Matthew chapter 8, and this storm blows up. And, um, you know, the Scripture tells us that Jesus is down in the bottom of the ship and He's asleep. Right? And when this storm blows up, the disciples, it's late in the evening, and the disciples come running up and, you know, to Jesus, and they wake Him up and they say, Lord, save us! We're going to drown! You know? We're going to drown! Come and save us! And, 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 and Jesus answered, He says, Why are you afraid? Your faith is about this big. You know? And that's the truth, isn't it? You know, we think about it. That's what happens. When we, he stood up, and Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. And the word for rebuke there, it means the muzzle. Like, you know, like you put a muzzle on a barking dog. Everything just calmed down. And the text says when that, when that happened, you know, the, the, the storm was muzzled. The disciples just sat there in awe, and they said, Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? See, in this passage we see the um, omnipresence of God because God was with the disciples even when he was asleep. You know, Jesus was asleep, but he was still God and he was still with them. We see the omnipotence of God because Jesus was able to calm the storm. But what we don't see a lot of times is the omniscience of God in this story. I want you to see the omniscience of God in this story because if you aren't careful, we'll miss that part. So the question is, you know, Jesus knew the storm was going to be there, didn't he? And he knew he was going to have to rebuke the storm, didn't he? He knew the disciples were going to be afraid. Think, think about it. So he knew how that was going to happen. So why didn't he just go ahead and rebuke the storm to start with? And when the disciples started screaming like little girls before they ever come down and ask him, why didn't he just go ahead and calm it down so they wouldn't wake him up? You know, probably what I would have done. You know, don't disturb my sleep. But then, but he waited until the disciples came to him and asked him to rebuke that storm. You think there was a reason for that? I bet you there was a reason for that. And so today, what I want you to understand is there's a connection here with our asking. There's a connection with praying. And so well, that's what we're talking about is prayer. And so sometimes we think, well, God's all-knowing. Why do we need to pray? You know, He already knows what's going to happen. Why do I need to ask Him to do stuff? He's all-powerful. He's working everything out. Why do I need to pray? Because He wants us to pray. And He's using our prayer to bring us into a, a place where we trust Him. He's using our need of Him to humble us. That's why. So you see, we need to pray. We need to ask God. And when things get tough, God wants us to know that, that we can depend on Him. And He wants us to call out to Him. You know, and, and some of you, I, I'm trying to think of a good illustration because I didn't really think through this, but but you know, a lot of times my kids are struggling with something. I don't come to their rescue. I let them struggle with it for a minute. See if I can figure it out. And, but you know what? If, if they really need me and they're calling for me, guess what I do? If they ask me to help them, I help them. You know? And that's what God does. A lot of times He's just waiting on us to ask. You know? Because think what Jesus said. He said, you have not because what? Say it. You ask not. You ask not. Don't blame God when you don't have. He says, ask and you shall receive. You know, and so, so that's why every day we, we, need, we can go to God. We can ask for His wisdom. We can ask for His direction. We can ask for His best future for us. And we can pray for Him to give us His plan, His best plan for our life. And we can trust Him in the present. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 are very popular <coughs> proverb. I saw somebody share it on Facebook this morning. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And so, our own understanding, we've we got to quit 
but relying on our own understanding of it. Because I don't know about you, but my understanding's messed up. But God's is not. So we got to rely on His understanding and, and His ways and let Him direct our paths. And so we got to ask Him and let Him lead our, uh, us into our future. So now there's a, there's a one-time commitment that we make, and we talked about this morning in Celery a little bit, that when we uh, commit to follow Christ and our hearts change and our, our lives are transformed and we begin to follow Jesus, uh, but but we've got to seek Him daily, don't we? Even as followers of Christ, even if you're a believer who's been redeemed, every day you got to seek out God and His will for, for what, what that day is. you got to seek Him. And so, uh, we got to... Trusting God's omniscience is a daily thing. It's a present thing, day by day, okay? So now let's look at where, we, where we're at. We talked about trusting God for our future, being able to relax and, and trust God completely about what's going to happen. We've talked about trusting God in our present by recommitting daily and having that prayer time and asking God to help day by day, moment by moment, decision by decision. But now I want you to see the third one. And we've, we've, we've already hinted at this, and y'all know I can trust God with my past. See, if you trust God with your past, you can trust Him with your present and your future, can't you? A lot of times people don't want to trust God because they love their past. You know? And so, some of you say, I don't know if I can trust God with my present, or I don't know if I can trust God with my future. And the reason is, you've not trusted Him with your past, you know? And so, let's be real honest. We've all got things in our past that we wish God didn't know. That's part, that's part of our authentic community. And I mean, you know, one of our core values, we want to be authentic. There's no need to hide the things we've struggled with. We're all struggling with something but in the past. Some of, a lot of us are all struggling with something now. That's why we're here, so we can help one another. But there are a lot of things that we don't want people to know, and there's a lot of things we don't want God to know, right? And so we, we want to hide those things. And, 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 you know, some of us have some minor sins in our past, right? Some of us have some major sins in our past. You know, and I've got things in my past I wish God didn't know. I mean, there are times in my past when I sinned gloriously. You know what I mean? And, and, and I wish God didn't know about those things. And I bet you do too. You know, and sometimes we say, God is not going to give us what we need today. And He's not going to take care of my future because we feel like we can't get past this baggage from our past. You know, we're trying to bring our... Don't bring your past up to God when God's done forgiving you of your past, okay? That's what we... Well, don't bring that stuff with you. Leave it. You know, you don't need that stuff anymore. And don't let Satan bring it up. Don't let anybody hand it to you. Let it go. Uh, you know, it, it, I want you to see how God views our past. I, I want you to see the proper response. And to do that, I want us to go to the most famous story in the Bible. Maybe the most famous. One of the most famous. I say that probably with every passage. But anyway, <laughs> the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son. Y'all familiar with that story? It's a story about a son who was, uh, you know, he was uh, due to inherit a large sum of money from his father and so but he didn't want to wait for his father to die you know he just went up to his dad and said dad you know i can't wait for you to die i want my inheritance now you think I'm, that's not i mean that's basically what he said you know it's, it sounds funny but but in reality I, you know it's amazing if i would say all right i'm cutting you out <laughs> that's what i'd have said you know you go on do whatever you want to do but you ain't getting nothing you know but the father was gracious, and he, he gave him everything, you know, that, that was coming to him. And, and uh, you know, in the story, so the son, son goes out, and he spends his money extravagantly. I think that's what it says in the King James. But anyway, you know, as a matter of fact, that's what the word prodigal means. It means, you know, a wasteful extravagance. That's how he spent his money. Some of us have done that, that way, <laughs> you know. But uh, some of the wives are going, "Yeah, I know somebody that did." But anyway, but 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 prodigal is a person who who spends his money with wasteful extravagance. So what he does is he just lives it up. Y'all know the story. He, you know, he, you know, in today's terms, you know, he went partying and clubbing and and you know, spent his money on booze and women and drugs and whatever he thought would give him a high in the day. You know? And then all of a sudden, guess what he found? His biffle was empty. His biffle was empty. He, went, he done run through all this money. And um, where he found himself then was in the pig style. But working on a pig farm. 
The Bible says when he slopped the pigs, he's so hungry, he'd eat the pig slop. I don't know about you, but I'd have to be pretty good and hungry to eat pig slop. You know? And this is even worse because this guy, you know, is a Jew, and, and they really look down on swine, you know, and pigs and stuff. But anyway, I won't get into all that right now. But, but all of a sudden, in Luke chapter 15, the Bible says when he came to his senses, he said to himself, you know, my father has all these hired people on his farm. They got it way better off than I got it right now. So he said, I will go to my father. And I'll ask my father not to accept me back as a son, but to hire me as one of his servants. <laughs> you know? So here he goes. And so he was dying because he, he, he but he wasn't dying of hunger, he was dying because of sin. You know, that's what he said. He said, I'm gonna go do this because I'm dying. But he was dying because of sin. And he goes to his father and uh, you know, he, he, he tells his father, he says, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer to be worthy to call your son, so please take me on as a hired man. Now you see the difference? Before this young man went to his father, and he said, Father, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my money. And now he says, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me work for you for food and money. Think he's changed? Changed, he's been humble. He's been humble. And so so look at what the father does. It says, so when he returned home to his father, and his father saw him come. You think his father had been looking for him? His father loved him. And so he's looking and he sees his son coming. He recognizes him a long way off. <laughs> That's what the text says. And he didn't wait on his son to get to the door. He, he ran out and met him. And he embraced him. And he kissed him. And, and, and you know, when he embraces him, kisses him, the, 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 the son said to his father, he says exactly what he said he was going to say. He says, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm no worthy to be called your son. And his father responded, he said, Go, uh, he tells the servant, says, Go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party because my son, who was lost, is now found. See? Now the, the father knew. You know, all, he, he knew probably everything. He probably been keeping tabs on him. He probably knew what his son had done. He could imagine anyway. But he didn't cast him out. He didn't turn him away, did he? He loved him anyway. He loved him anyway. And he, he brought him in. He said, kill the, the fatted calf. Get a ring and put it on his finger. Get him uh, new sandals and put him on his uh, put him on his feet. And, and so they start this party. Now, I mean, you know, that's a picture of how God will receive us when we come back to Him. That's what it's the image of. And so, you see, the past didn't stand in the way for the Son reestablishing re a relationship with the Father. And so even though God knows all about our past, God knows all about our past. He even knows the mistakes we're going to make in the future. He loves us anyway. And his arms are open. And he's ready to have that relationship with us. The question is not whether he's ready. The question is whether you're ready. You know, he will receive us. And, and if we want to return to God and have God forgive our past and receive the welcome from God like the prodigal son received, we've got to repent. And humbly and sincerely. We've got to repent of sin humbly and sincerely. And so the word repent means to change your mind or to change your direction. It, it, the, the Greek term means to do an about face. So if you and it's in the military, you know, you march in one way, you do an about face, you turn around, and you go completely opposite direction. And that's what repentance is. You go in your way, which is messed up, and all of a sudden you realize your messed up way is getting you nowhere, and you're going to repent humbly, and you turn around and you go God's way. That's what we're talking about here, okay? And so the Bible, the Bible says... Uh, something really cool about what, what we've been talking about today about sin. When we do that, when we repent of sin and we turn away from sin and we, we turn to God, uh, the Bible says something about sin. It kind of goes against everything we've been teaching today about God. You know what it, what it is? It's, it, it's that when we sincerely repent and ask God to forgive us of our sin, God chooses to forget that sin. 
even though even though God knows everything, look what He says. God says, "I will forgive their wickedness, and will never again remember their sins." <laughs> now, God doesn't really forget our sins. What it is is He He uh, He never brings them up against us. That's what happens. He acts as if they never happened. That's a good thing. That's something to say amen about. That's something to say praise the Lord. I know that my God will forgive me and my Father will accept me and all the things I've done in my life that have been against Him and against and, and uh, uh, you know have, have brought shame to Him, He's, gonna, he's never going to bring those things up. He's never going to bring those things up. I will forgive their wickedness. And I'll never again remember the sins. What an incredible promise. Amen. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God for this. And so this morning, maybe you're here this morning and, and you need a fresh start with God. You know, maybe maybe today you need to start clean. Maybe today for the first time you need to trust God with your life. Maybe today you'd say, okay God, I'm going to trust you with my future. I'm going to trust you with my, past, uh, my present. I'm going to trust you with my past. And so uh, maybe today you need to take that step this morning. Maybe for the first time you just need to lean into God and say, God, I'm handing my life over to you. I've made such a mess of my life. I want to give it to you. And if you if you need, you know, that's what it means to be a Christian, ultimately. You know, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus is, is to give up control of your own heart and life and give that to Jesus because of who He is and what He's done. Will you do that this morning? Maybe some of you here, you just need to recommit. And you say, God, you know, I know I belong to you, but... but I've not been walking your way. I've been I've been living by my plan and I need to get on your plan. So maybe today you need to do a recommitment. You just sit there and say, Lord, forgive me and help me from this day forward to walk your way. Show me your plan and help me to do that day by day. You know, I just want you to, and so this morning, everybody just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. Maybe 